VR Systems Incorporated, right here in Tallahassee, Florida. You guys are security folks, so if you pay attention to the news back in 2016, our company made national news. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what really happened and why it continues today and uh, those types of things. But before I begin, I just need to know are there any media in the room? Okay. Yeah, I don't talk to the media. Uh, they get it wrong many times because they're looking for a salacious story. Blood. And yeah. pardon? Looking for blood, they're not looking for Exactly. And, and when you give them the right story, if it's not meaty enough or juicy enough, they won't go back and correct the record. And if they do a correction, it's usually on page 14 or something like that. And who cares then when you were already on the front page? So my talk today is really going to be about what happened to us and just sharing with you guys, uh, you know, a little bit of the information about what we went through. Um, we're located here in Tallahassee. We've been in business since 1992. We're on our 26th year. We're a, a relatively unknown company here in Tallahassee, but that's because we don't do anything publicly. Our customers are those folks who conduct elections across the United States. In Florida, we have 20, excuse me, there are 67 counties in Florida. 64 of them currently use our products. So uh, we're the big vendor in the state of Florida. We have three major product lines, a voter reg system, electronic poll books, and then we do web hosting or website type products. Those products, like on election night, when you're trying to figure out who won the election, election night reporting, you go into CNN and you see the candidate that's in the lead or what we call heat maps. Uh, how it turned out, you know, how many voters went from this precinct or this area. That's the type of information that we dish up to our supervisors of elections here in Florida, and they provide it to Fox, CNN, all of those types of people. Outside of Florida, we also have customers. We currently are nationwide. We are in eight states, and we're continuing to grow. We just uh, inked a contract with the District of Columbia. We will be installing them this year and we are working in Texas and New York City so those are moving. We're in all the controversial areas because of what we do. If you think about it, when people are watching elections, where do they watch? They watch Florida, we're in Florida. North Carolina, we're in North Carolina. They watch New York, we're in New York. They watch California, and here lately, Illinois, because if you think about the 2016 election cycle, during Illinois, uh, during that cycle, hackers actually got in to the Illinois voter registration database. Um, and that's sort of where our story began. So, yes, sir. If I may ask a question. So, the, the places that you're going to, like Illinois, was there, I mean, protections in place? Was there... And, or are you the first protection they're putting in place there, per se? I would say they had state employees who were doing many of the same type things. I know we have state employees here that were doing many of the same type things that you guys are doing. Uh, one of the problems that you run into in those voter reg systems is just because you have activity coming in from China or from Russia, it doesn't automatically mean it's a bad actor. We have uniform overseas voters who are in those places and they need to be able to get their information so they can cast ballots and do those things also. So you don't have the ability to go in and just blanket cut them out because of where they're coming from. So we use advanced monitoring tools to take a look at those to ensure that it's not bot activity and if it is human activity and it's people on keyboards that they're not doing malicious activity when they're in there. But I will tell you, in Illinois, what had happened, my understanding, they had gotten into the state voter registration database. We don't do that. Uh, we are local databases only. But they had gotten in there, they had put a PowerShell in there, and what they were doing was actually pulling and, and updating data. So they were changing addresses and changing parties. So that's the biggest thing. You go to the polling place, you're trying to get your ballot, if your address is changed, your, your ballot is determined by your, re, uh, your residence address. So that information being changed could change the ballot that you receive. If they've changed your party and it's a primary, you show up to vote for the Republicans, they've changed you to Democrat, you're not allowed to vote for that Republican candidate that you want to vote for, 
So you have to vote a provisional ballot. Now in the end, that's gonna go back in front of the canvassing board and the canvassing board would determine that your ballot should count, but it creates a lot of chaos. And what the bad actors are really interested in doing, they are not interested in crossing that line of debarkation. They don't want to modify results. They don't want to modify anything. They want the public to believe it's been modified. They want to scare the public at large and make them worry that something's happened to steal that election. As a matter of fact, one of the ladies who was caught double voting here in Florida, when she was actually caught and she went before the state's attorney, the reason that she said that she did it, she knew what she was doing, is because of all the hype about all the Democrats that were double voting. So she was going to go double voting. <laughs> so, so, she the well. <laughs> yeah, so she was trying to even it up. And it was because of the social media and the hype around that. So this is our company. Um, we actually, we're headquartered here in Tallahassee. We have offices in Denver, Colorado, Charlotte, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Chicago, and then also an office outside of Sacramento, California. So we are a nationwide organization. We began here 25 years ago. Uh, at the beginning, we were founded by David and Jane Watson, who later sold the company to the employees. We're the only employee-owned company in elections in the United States, so we're relatively unique. We're what's called an ESOP, an employee stock-owned company. So anybody who comes to work for us becomes an owner. Um, and that gives you a little bit. Uh, elections are all we do. I do usually mention tenure. Most of the folks in our company have been with us at least 10 years. Uh, we don't have a high turnover rate. We're a pretty good place to work. A little hectic. And that's our Tallahassee group. Um, we recently purchased a building, I guess a couple years ago, over on Commonwealth up in the industrial complex. If you're going down 10 and you see the big copper building, we're across the street from that. So here's what happened. We found ourselves in the media spotlight. Uh, then we had to figure out how we were going to manage the crisis. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we came out on the other side. Um, First off, it's important to understand, and I know you guys know because you're in the technical field, there's a difference between phishing uh, and spear phishing and actually hacking. Uh, but these are terms that we've been educating our customers about. So in the summer 2016, this is after the Illinois hack had taken place, uh, we got a phone call from the state of Florida that said that the FBI is going to have a call and we'll talk about some threats that are happening and we would like you guys to be on the call with all the election officials in the state of Florida. Uh, we said, great, that's wonderful. That gives us a little bit of information. We had started to hear all the political banter that was going back and forth on hacking and Russian associations and all of that, so we wanted to be vigilant. Uh, we were also told on that call, you can't talk. Don't let anybody else know you're on there because we're not letting other vendors in the room. So we were brought in. During that conversation, we were told by the FBI uh, that they had a list of IP addresses that were known suspected IP addresses. Do you guys subscribe to the FBI flash bulletins? You should. Uh, you don't have to be anyone special. You can, if you're working in the security arena, you can apply to those when they come out. They'll tell you the big malware that's out there, like Emotet, which I heard them talk about, the other things like that. Yes, sir. Are you talking about the same ones that Infogard sends out? Is that, or is it something different? It may be. I don't get mine from Infogard, but that may be the case. Okay. Uh, we get them directly from the FBI. It's a flash bulletin that includes all the IP addresses that you should be looking to see if there's activity inside your system. So we got that, and we went back to take a look to see, you know, have these bad actors been looking at us? And we saw some activity. Now, the activity was not actually penetrating our system, but it was doing reconnaissance. So they were going and looking. Uh, so when you think about, you know, I, I heard you guys talking, the last speaker talking about one of the major threats was social engineering. And it is. Your people are the weakest link. So they're going to take a look and they're going to see if they can figure out how they can use your people against you. So in Florida, um, we were told, you know, take a look at these IPs. We went and looked. What we found they were doing is they were looking at our website. They were looking at our customers' websites. They were looking for information like who is the product manager, who is this. Because in Florida, they can go on the state association website 
of election officials just like they can in every state in the United States and they can see who's the vendor for tabulation, for electronic poll books, for voter registration, for everything that they use. And that's because the public at large wants their elections to be totally visible to the public. You want to know everything. Well, you're not the only one looking at it. There are bad actors who are also looking at it. Because if I make it visible to you as a voter, they also have to make it visible to anybody that wants to see it. So you have folks from around the globe that are looking at that. They see all of a sudden Florida, which is a swing state. It was predicted to be one of those states that was either going to make or break Trump or Clinton. So by looking to see which vendors were where, and as I mentioned, we're in 64 of the 67 counties, they could then go to our website and see who's the product manager for this product. And then because elections are public in the state of Florida, email addresses are also extremely easy to find. The technicians in each county, the supervisors of election in each county, you know, the people who train poll workers, their names, their email addresses, all that stuff is in the public because the public wants to know. So what they did is they went to our website and, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but so I'll, I'll jump down. They went to our website, they created this fake email that looked like it was coming from us. They stole our logo, they put the name of one of our product managers, and fortunately, because we had already been doing education with our customers and early voting had already begun in Florida, um, when they sent an email saying this is a technical update to your electronic poll books, our customers said, whoa, they picked up the phone and they called me and they said, Ben, it looks like I got a fake email that just came in from you that's saying click on this link so I can download. And one, we don't send technical updates that way. We have a private space that all of our customers have to authenticate themselves and log into with token authentication and then download updates. We send them emails telling them the update is available. And during a live election, no election company in the world would ever update technical data or software during that election unless we were already in crisis. So that would mean that you, the customer, had already been on the phone with me saying, hey, this product is doing X and I can't stand it. I'm going to end up in the media. I'm going to do this. You've got to fix this right now. So you would have known before I sent the software that it was coming because I would have been fixing your problem. Our customers, they've been around a while. They knew that they were fake. So what we did is we got a hold to the FBI and we told them. So uh, we went back, the FBI told us, said, well, actually, VR Systems, you got an email earlier that was a phishing email. And we said, well, we get phishing emails all the time. You know, we quarantine them and get rid of them. Well, we found out the bad actor was actually coming from um, it was sent in to seven addresses at VR. One of them was commerce at VR systems. That's not a real email address. One might have been something like John at VR systems. We don't have a John. Uh, so they immediately bounced. They didn't go into our server. The five that came in, the first one that was opened was opened by one of my software developers. And you guys are techs, you're software type people. Uh, the email claimed to be from Microsoft, and it said, you're out of space in your email client. Click on this to buy more space. <laughs> Lots of misspellings in there. Uh, obviously, my computer science guy did not click on it. If he had, he would have been unemployed. Uh, but he didn't. He, he walked next door to my DevOps manager, and he said, hey, I, I've got a phishing email. What are you going to do with it? The guy, my DevOps manager looked at it, and he quarantined all five of the emails. None of them have been opened. So we know they didn't get opened inside our system. And at the time, I, I heard you guys talking about FireEye. We utilize FireEye Mandiant. We have a thing called Threat Analytics Protocol that protects all of our email, everything inside of our service. We also have a thing from Department of Homeland Security where they do a cyber hygiene analysis on all of our public facing websites in real time. Uh, the other thing, if someone had clicked on it and they had gotten our credentials, unless they had the UB key of the individual in my company, they could not have sent an email from us to our customers. We utilize UB keys and have used them for years. Uh, we're about to move up to the next version. Uh, but 
So that's the type of thing that we do. So we knew immediately that we had not been breached, that uh, it was just a phishing activity. And our customers who had received these emails, they were phished. Um, fortunately, what we did find out later is that most of the emails that were received from our customers, the spam filters immediately quarantined them. So uh, we're not aware that any of our customers ever opened them and they were ever breached. However, at this time, and let's see how far, so I, we, we quarantined, no staff click, we notified the FBI. And the reason was, at this time in our country, there was no methodology for me as a vendor to alert other <laughs> vendors in the United States or other people of this potential threat that may be coming. The only way I had to do it was to call the FBI or law enforcement. And we knew we were clean and clear, but we said, hey, I want to share this information because if we're under attack, folks who may not have the technical department and the defenses that we have in place may be under attack also, and we want to make sure they're good to go. So we call the FBI. During this time in our life here in the United States, we were in transition. The FBI is the people I should have called, but Department of Homeland Security was making a play at that time for elections to come under Homeland Security. It had not yet happened, and during the process of the transition, it happened somewhere in here that elections were now deemed critical infrastructure, so they fell under Department of Homeland Security. So during that time, the FBI had to transfer all of their information over to DHS, and some things did not get sanitized the way that they should have been sanitized, and a young lady who had a name that had to be made for primetime TV, reality winner, who was a contractor, this is a real name, I'm not making this up. She was a contractor that used to be with the Army in intelligence, came back to work for the NSA in Georgia. Uh, obviously she had political uh, beliefs and she was angry that they could not prove that Russia had been hacking into elections. So she took it upon herself to print out this report that she believed was the smoking gun. She folded it up and stuffed it inside her uh, pantyhose, went home, and then emailed it to a, what I did not, I, I didn't know these guys were a media outlet, but a small company by the name of The Intercept in, uh, up around D.C. that reports on cyber and political and this type of stuff. So I got a phone call, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself again. Okay, we were notified by a customer that we received the spear phishing email. I told you about that. Within 15 minutes of getting that, we determined that it was spear phishing, 122. And uh, we were on the phone calling all of our customers, saying, if you get something like this, don't open it. And then uh, shortly, within an hour, I had an email out to all of my customers telling them, because I got a screenshot from my customer, and sent it out and said, this is what it looks like, don't open it. So, so we protected them immediately. But then when we shared, uh, we found out it went to 122 email addresses. It's a great example of social engineering. Like I said, they went and found the information, they found that we were the biggest vendor, and then they tried to use that as a trusted source to get it in. I received a phone call from The Intercept requesting comment. Well, I knew what they were talking about, but I'm like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, they claimed to have leaked documents from the NSA saying that we were breached. So I requested a copy of the document. Are you laughing at the fourth bullet? Uh -huh. Well, it's, it's true, man. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm 53 years old, you know, and everybody talks about your 15 minutes of fame. I didn't want my first 15 minutes of fame. I didn't want mama to hear about it from somebody other than me. So my first phone call, I called Salter Mitchell. We use a public relations firm here in Tallahassee. They're a, a national firm. And whenever we have any type of crisis management, they're engaged. So I got on the phone uh, with April Salter. Uh, she immediately came into our office, set up to help us deal with the media barrage that was about to hit. Um, second phone call was to our corporate attorney. I need to understand where am I at, at risk, what's fixing to happen. I called the FBI because I'd already been working with an agent of the FBI out of Jacksonville, and I said, WTF, um, 
we gave you this information and now there's a report that's leaked out to the intercept and I'm about to be thrown under the bus nationally. Well, just so you know, the report that went out to the intercept, it redacted the name of our company, but it talked about the attack and it said company A, which is who we were, uh, that the method of attack was to send emails to their customers about the EVID product, which is our copyrighted, trademarked product that's only built and managed and supported by VR Systems and Tallahassee Co. Yeah, so, so it's pretty easy for them to say, oh, that's company A. So a really poor job of sanitizing the information. But yeah, I called mom and I wanted to know, hey, I'm about to be on the national news and I want you to know everything's okay. It, it, it's all right. So this is what the, uh, the document looked like that was released. Uh, where they sanitized it, it was on the, uh, the Intercept's webpage. This probably got them more notoriety than any story I think they've ever run. So they continue to run updates on this and they try to call and even though, you know, what I've told you about it being a phishing attempt, it was not a breach and all of that, and they've been told over and over, they continue to find experts that will say, oh no, but we believe they were breached. So the stories never die. And that's the thing. I know you guys are in the business of protecting your companies, but you have to tell those in the C-suite, like myself, that their job is to be ready, even if you don't get breached, for this type of activity, because someday it may happen. So we were flooded with calls and emails from news outlets. Uh, as I mentioned, the Salter Mitchell team moved into VR systems. We had news uh, vehicles parked outside of our building waiting for employees to leave and, and come in, and, and we were telling them to go straight to the parking lot, get in your car and go home, don't stop. Uh, they were calling, we were getting invitations from Good Morning America, all kind of people who wanted to talk about this breach. Um, we sent an email to all election officials in our customer jurisdictions letting them know this was on June 5th, and we notified staff how to handle potential questions. They went so far as to go into LinkedIn profiles and look at employees that had been interns for us to ask them questions about our company. So when you're thinking about, you know, I know the gentleman before me talked about what you put on your resume or what you're putting out there on job boards, it's also the companies you work for. So they're looking for folks that may not have the loyalty to the company that you have as a permanent employee, but people who have been there just to get them on the record so they can use them. So um, just another example of the information that went out. So we went on the defensive. The first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to communicate to everyone that it was a spear phishing attempt that didn't breach our systems. The other thing we wanted people to know because the public at large was being led to believe that if our systems were breached that there was data that could have been gotten from our systems. We don't host any customer data. There is no voter registration information over on Commonwealth Drive or in any of our systems. We build software systems that we deploy inside the customer's network and then they load it with the data and they manage it. Much like you buy Windows, Microsoft can't get into the Word document that you just built or the PowerPoint document that I built. We build that software and then the customers populate and maintain the data, which are the voter registration information and all of that but they didn't share that with the news articles. They, that's not something that was juicy enough, I guess. So, uh, and then we attempted to provide facts on the, fish, on the fishing attempts. Stories never die. Uh, we need a long-term strategy, and we made a decision we could continue to be on the defensive and defend when the folks came in, or we could take this as an opportunity for us to get out in the lead in our sector and lead the way in security. So that's the path that we took. Um, so since that happened, we became members of the Homeland Security Information Network. Uh, we now subscribe to MSS ISAC, which is a multi-state information security. Sure, so, yeah, sir. that's it. Yeah, you're with the state, right? Mm -hmm. I knew I recognized you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so we belong to that. Uh, we also belong to another organization called the EI ISAC, which is Election Infrastructure. Uh, uh, ISAC. Um, 
we formed at this time, as I said, that elections now come under critical infrastructure under Department of Homeland Security. Um, we also formed at, uh, a, an organization that works with Department of Homeland Security. Our government counterparts, they come together with the election officials and the IT folks in their sector to represent what's called the GCC, Government Coordinating Council. Well, we recognize that there are three legs to the stool. You've got uh, the security folks like Department of Homeland Security, you've got the election officials who are trying to manage and maintain that election, but you also have the vendors who are supporting and, and providing the software. And there was no venue at that time for the vendors to be able to be involved in that circle. So we stood up the Subsector Coordinating Council, and it was stood up right after this. We elected five individuals to represent all the vendors in the United States, and I was elected by my peers to be a representative, I think because of everything we had gone through and all the positive action we had taken. Uh, we look, let's see, I'm making sure I'm covering everything. We participate in election center conferences. I've spoken across the United States about the activities that we've had. I'm trying to make sure I tailor this so you're getting the best information out of it. And uh, sometimes I'm speaking to people who have no technical background, so you, know, you don't go too deep. Uh, the EAC is the Election Assistance Commission. We have formed a very tight relationship with the EAC out of Washington, D.C., which works under federal charter. Um, so the world today compared to the world the way it was in 2016, we are a much closer network of election folks, whether we're on the vendor side, the state side, or working inside the counties or the federal organizations, communicating together. Since this was stood up, we now have uh, virtual rooms that we go to when national and state elections are going on where we can communicate threats in real time. We don't have to go through these types of venues and then worry about that type of information getting out incorrectly into the public. And we see activity all the time. Do you have a question? I, I guess I got settled. Can I? Sure. I'm not media, so please. That's okay. <laughs> I would probably so answer on, it. If so you were prior to 2016 or, or now, do you, was there standards in place then? I'm going to say like NIST or you know CMSS or anything like that. And is there is, is there now that you follow? It depends upon the the product. Now there's a NIST framework that we follow. The NIST framework uh, that's established, but they're guidelines. They are not governing documents. Well, that's the reason why I was going to ask is like what. Where I work, those are still written guidelines, but were edicted through law to actually follow those. And so that was going to be a follow-on question: yeah. Is so? You, but you are the vend the vendors are not edicted to follow them. Only the people who, right? The government organizations. But a private vendor would they be edicted to follow those guidelines? We follow them, but I'm asking that question. Well, so I'm the going to, I'm going to say they have to build to those guidelines. Right. They, they can't violate. Uh, they have to have a yeah. waiver to roll backwards. Yeah. For instance. Now so we we go through certification processes, but it depends upon each state because each state different rules. Right? Yeah, they have total autonomy to conduct their elections independently. So that means they're beholden to the legislature in the state, and every time you elect a new legislature. They immediately think the one thing they can fix is elections, but they know nothing about the administration of elections. They know about running campaigns. Right. So what happens is they get elected and they think, you know, it's so daggum hard for me to do one, two, and three. That's what we need to fix in elections. And they're not thinking about the back end of conducting that election, of managing all the aspects of hiring poll workers, getting them paid, getting assets out to the polling place. All of the things that we take for granted, you know, my mom asked me when I first came to work in elections, what do you do the other three years? And the truth is, uh, in Florida, I, I'm glad you guys laughed. In Florida, there's an election going on in Florida almost every week of the year. Uh, there's always somebody either getting ready for an election, conducting, or after an election, doing the post-process activity and preparing for the next one. Um, you know, it, it's not just governor and president. Uh, there are fire districts, there are tax boards, there are school boards. Pretty much there's always something going on, so we're always preparing. The other thing is in our industry, we are either preparing to 
conduct an election or we're preparing software for the next major release so we can conduct an election. So as soon as 2018 was over, we began testing for deployment of 2020. So we're about to freeze 2020 software, we'll go into full on testing, and then we'll start deploying it at the end of this year so they can begin testing in our customer bases to use it in early 19. So there's always something going on, but yes. Um, and then a lot of that's dependent upon the state. So here in the state of Florida, uh, they require certification for tabulation. That's where your ballot goes and it, it marks your ballot or counts it. Um, there is no certification required for electronic poll books. Well, folks say, why not? Well, what's the difference between an electronic poll book and a printed poll book? So how do you make one certify and not the other? And then you have trusted vendors that have been in place. For instance, our electronic poll book was first used in 2004. We were the first poll book in the United States. And it happened because Hurricane Charlie came into Port Charlotte. It decimated all the polling places. We already did voter registration. So we did a mobile version of that voter reg on laptops. And it became the genesis of what is now an electronic poll book. So, like I said, I could talk for four hours on this. Topic. I've got others, but I'll, I'll just hold yes, sir. I'll, I got um, I'll hold on. So, the things we've done in security since this uh, threat is, uh, you know, human firewall training for all of our staff on an annual basis. We implemented uh, multi-factor authentication, U2F. Uh, we now use the UBTs. We were already using the multi-factor for all of our senior management and C-Suite, which is who was at threat. Uh, we hired Firearm Mandiant. If you know anything about cybersecurity consultants in the nation, they're top tier. Uh, those guys in CyberStrike are the two big dogs, and uh, they just, they cost a lot, but they're worth what you pay. And then we take advantage of all applicable security features within Amazon and Azure within our cloud environment. We are a C-Sharp shop, so our software is developed in uh, C-Sharp and then we use some other uh, languages also. We participate in all of these activities. We were the first vendor in the United States to have a risk and vulnerability assessment done uh, in our entire infrastructure and we came out clean. Uh, then after that, because the media kept saying, oh no, you will breach, you will breach, you will breach. We brought DHS in again, this time for a two week engagement. They brought in about 12 individuals that came into our company and they sat inside our firewall and went through all of our data. Uh, our threat analytics protocol actually uh, collects all transactional data, everything going throughout our system. We gave them, I want to say it was about 15 terabits of information, and they went through all of that in a two-week exercise and found no problems. They did make some recommendations, and you know, some of the things the last guy was talking about, you know, so if they get through your front end, what happens when they're in your system? We now segment our system, so if someone were to get in, they can only go to that isolated area. They can't bounce around inside of our system, and that came out of the, uh, uh, the risk and vulnerability assessment, the second two-week activity. It's called a hunt activity. The reason it's called hunt is traditionally when that happens is uh, they are hunting for something because they already know there was a breach. It's hunt hurt. Incident response team or hunt is more of a, they're just looking. Um, and then we're the only vendor right now in the United States that's gone through both an RVA and a HUD activity. Uh, so now we share and educate others. Uh, we began participating with FBI response in what's called uh, the Cyberhood Watch Group. It began in California. We were the first vendor in the United States to be brought into that. And then, as I mentioned, we were elected by our peers to be a founding member of the executive board working with the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, we, I'm on the phone with the FBI and DHS probably weekly, uh, just sharing and, and talking about. And then we get updates from them daily uh, that are in the uh, TLP protocol, that things that I can share with the community, things that I can't. Vendors now have the ability to get security clearances. I was one of the first vendors in the United States, not government or state, uh, to be issued a security clearance. I've had one before, but much easier this time. I don't know. Uh, 
I mentioned we belong to MSI SAC and the EII SAC. I'm not going to go into great deal. How am I doing on time? You've got about 30 minutes. It's okay. 3:30. Okay. Um, I mentioned we do the human firewall training regularly. One thing that we found out is um, FDLE. FDLE will come into your organization and do human firewall at no charge. They have a, uh, a trainer that will come in. It's not the best training, but you know some of the people in your organization just need to be trained. They need to hear it on a regular reoccurring basis. One of the threats that we're hearing about and they're changing their tactics is they will go in and if they're interested in trying to get into the organization that you're representing, they don't directly go after you or the person they're trying to get in through. They'll look and socially try to find out about your spouse. So for instance, they find out your spouse or, or your significant other is on a bowling league. And they see that that bowling league bowls every week down at the Tallahassee Bowl, which is right across the street or it's uh, across the street from the pizza joint and they will send a coupon to your significant other for a free slice of pizza or whatever at that pizza joint right across from the bowling league in hopes that they'll click on it and print it out and then they just put malware on that device. That malware, how many times do people in the house use the same PC or laptop? So by doing that, they then can get in and steal the credentials of the individual they're trying to get in. They're not attacking direct. They are going one or two tiers later. They're looking for your child that's on a swim team. They're looking for somebody that's on a soccer league. So, and when you talk to the people in your organization, you need to remind them of that type of information. That while you have to be careful not to click on these links while you're at work, you also need to be careful to share the information with your significant other so that they don't do it. Uh, my wife has joined us in the back of the room. I'm fortunate because she is with the Department of Defense and she gets all this there. So I don't have to worry about her clicking on that kind of stuff. And we probably don't share the same computers anyway. Um, so this, uh, you know, when I'm talking to folks about the potential attack vectors that come in through the election system, these are some of the vectors that we make them aware of. Um, I can tell you here in Florida, Florida takes it serious. What, and it's ironic that we were thrown into the news media because now that we do work in nine states in the United States, what people get away with outside of Florida, Florida would never allow. We are an extremely secure elections environment compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, at the end of the election, when we reconcile the, the check-ins, versus the total ballots that were cast. If they're off by one ballot in Florida, they're gonna find out why they're off by one ballot. In other states, they're gonna say, I don't want, it's just one, it's not a big deal. Or it's only five, or it's only 10. In Florida, they will run it down and they'll hunt it out. So I will tell you, I think because of what happened in Florida back in 2000 with the hanging chads and all yeah. of that activity, Florida became vigilant after that, and we have moved ourselves to the forefront of the elections community. So I would tell you that in most of the places in Florida, they're aware of this. Now recognize, I'm dealing with customers that may be in Miami-Dade, that have an entire staff of technical people working through the county to protect them, but then I may deal with Liberty County. You know where Liberty County is over here? They have three people in the office that do it all and they have 3,000 voters. Miami-Dade has 1.6 million voters. So our job to provide services for them is to help them protect themselves. So a lot of the products that we put out there because we do their web hosting, uh, we use a product called Splunk. Are you guys familiar with Splunk? Okay, so we use Splunk to be able to see where the, uh, the people are coming from across the globe and we can see that in real time. And if I see activity coming from bad states, where bad state actors are known to be, we consolidate that information and we share it with our customers to let them know that they may be under an active recon situation where someone's coming in to look. We do protect those sites so that they can't go in and uh, deface or modify data on those sites. But defacing, we think, is the biggest threat to elections. That if you are in an election environment and all of a sudden the website that's hosting that county says, your election has been hacked. Uh, or they say, 
the election day, you thought it was Tuesday, but this is supervisor of elections. It's been moved to Wednesday this week. Well, one, elections are always on Tuesday in Florida and everywhere else in the United States. But if you got told that the election would, a lot of people would believe it and they might not go out. So that's a method for them maybe to impact the elections. FVRS is Florida, Florida Voter Registration System. In Florida, as I was saying, we're ahead of everybody else. We utilize what's called Albert sensors in all of our counties in Florida, 100%. So the entire state, uh, we were the, were we the first in the United States to be 100%? We were. Okay, that's what I thought. So Florida is the first in the United States to be 100% protected using the Albert sensors. What is this? Uh, it's a monitor sensor that monitors all traffic going, uh, going and coming from the counties up to the state, 100% monitor. That information is consolidated together at both the state level and at the federal level, and they can look for trends and activity in there that then they can alert the folks in the counties that there's activity going on that's suspicious. Uh, it's very similar, like I said, we use Fire Mandiant through our threat analytics protocol. We, we've we got the same type thing, but we actually uh, pay for it through a private vendor. They get it through Albert. Albert, uh, any of you guys former DOD or been involved with DOD? Do you remember there used to be a, a sensor called Einstein? Einstein was inside the Department of Defense. It was the first deployed essentially threat analytics program or profile. And the follow on to that is Albert. It's the same, so Albert Einstein. Yeah. Um, we, get, we do what's called a daily side two analysis. What we're doing is because, like I said, 64 to 67 counties are our customers. So we can see the changes in their database and compare them to the changes in the state voter registration database. And if we see deltas between that two and our side two analysis, then we can report that information back if it's not explainable. So every day, my staff is doing a side two analysis on all the voter registration databases in the counties against what's at the state master file to see if there were any changes. So if there are changes coming from the state or from the county that are not being replicated because they're not going through the proper methodologies, they would show up there. So we would see that and then we could roll it back. So we're protected from that standpoint. Uh, I mentioned that we use a multi-factor authentication, U2F. Uh, all of our systems use data encryption. We use encrypted data at rest on our, voter on our electronic poll books. Uh, in our company, we use Microsoft Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Uh, cyber Protection and Monitoring Services, Fire Eye Splunk, AWS, Azure, Google Analytics, and Nessus. You guys use Nessus? Uh, Nessus is the product that we use to make sure that all of our desktops and all of our virtual servers and everything are patched and up to date. I heard the gentleman before me talking about one of the biggest threats is not being patched and up to date. We have that going on on a regular reoccurring basis every Wednesday. Uh, we have a maintenance window, I think between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. to patch and update everything inside of our system. Uh, and then updates that are made between our voter registration system, the state, and electronic poll books are transactional updates. The, why that's key is a voter record never travels by itself. So there's never a complete voter record that travels. Uh, it's just changes to that voter record. And they're encrypted. So if someone were to be able to get in there and sniff the packets to be able to see the data that was flowing, it would take them multiple days just to be able to assemble one voter record. So it's another method of protection. <coughs> and then in our offices, we monitor the entire state in real time. We have the ability to see which systems are up and operational. What this is though, is this is a web monitor that shows where the electronic phone books are that are being used across the state if they've timed out. If they were to get a uh, denial of service attack or something to that effect, we would start to see it. A few years ago when um, Netflix, if you remember the bot activity through Netflix that took down the internet on the East Coast, or it was a rolling, when that happened, we started seeing the failure actually move down through the state. And in the uh, ISPs and you know, Verizon, Altel, the services that they were using to connect to the internet. So we were able to see that activity actually happen in real time because of this ability. Uh, 
This is just our AWS CloudWatch activity monitoring across all of our nodes, and then we're also looking at all of our customer bases. We utilize DDoS attack uh, protections. I didn't put these together, so if you have a lot of questions, I can't answer those. Uh, Cross-site scripting. And then we have web-based defacement protections because we host and manage the websites on behalf of many of our customers here in Florida. This is some of the stuff that we get from Department of Homeland Security. And then uh, we have the ability to restore our customers' voter registration databases. Uh, should someone get in and corrupt those files, we actually back them up in a secure server with a physical encrypted key that we keep in a fire locker that to be able to restore it, we have to take that thumb drive, that key, load it in to actually rest restore their database. But should that happen, we can do that. We do nightly backups to the cloud for all the voter registration databases we manage. And uh, we work with our customers to integrate information into their continuity of operations plan. So a lot of this is in there. Uh, we also, here in Tallahassee, we host a remote emergency operations facility should one of our customers get hit by an inclement act of God like Bay County, when they got hit by the hurricane, we opened that site up to them. They would have, had they chosen, been allowed to relocate to us here in Com on Commonwealth, uh, and we could have actually restored their voter registration database, and working with the state, we could help them to run it remotely to conduct that election. Um, what a lot of people don't realize, most elections take place here in Florida during hurricane season, <laughs> so we're a threat. And more than one time, it's disrupted the elections. I mentioned back in 2004 with Hurricane Charlie, and then this year, uh, Maria. Michael. 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 Yeah, Maria was a few years back. This is Michael. We have Broward that had to leave because of Maria. Uh, yes. All I had. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, I come from a DOD background, so on, on, the, on the article it showed TSSI, right? It's a top secret, I'm assuming SI, system of information. Please, some, please tell me something happened to the young lady that stepped that document her pantyhose. Yeah, it did. She is in, she's in jail in Atlanta right now. Um, but her mother is still active on Twitter. Oh, so you can And she that. loves to talk about how she was right and our company was hacked and all this. So that stuff continues to go on. And then there's a large following behind uh, Ms. Winter that thinks because of the political bias around this subject, yeah, I don't know whether you're on the left or the right in politics, but if you're on the right, you believe one thing. If you're on the left, you believe something else. Um, and I have good news and bad news for both, the left and the right. Uh, we were not hacked, that's the bad news. The good news is the Russians are there and they've attempted. So one party wants you to believe they're not there and they've never attempted. The other party wants you to believe that we were owned. Not just us, everyone was owned. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, they did not get into elections in Florida. And, and you know, I have a lot of insight because I work with my friends at the state and in the county levels and we're not aware that if they, if they were able to penetrate, nothing was changed. There were no changes, no impacts voter registration records, anything. So, uh, but yeah, people want you to believe they totally changed everything, that there were millions of dead people who voted. One, we have yet to see a dead person show up at the polls, <laughs> right, right. fill out a ballot and cast it. Just because their name is on the voter registration roll, they have to show up with an identification that's approved by the state of Florida to be able to cast a ballot. So it's, you know, they say, well, there's two million people on the rolls that shouldn't be on the rolls in X county. Those people can't vote. <laughs> They're dead. Right. And unless you're wanting to perjure yourself and create a felony, you're not going to vote on their behalf. Right. And if you see what happens when that happens, take a look at the news in North Carolina. Uh, a gentleman was arrested yesterday who was running for office uh, who has been indicted on counts uh, voter fraud. Uh, because supposedly 
he collected ballots, marked them, and, and had them sent in on his behalf. So they're about to rerun an election that took place back in 2018 in North Carolina because of that activity. Yes, sir? So how much did it cost your company, this, this entire, whether it was related to reality winner or not, but yeah. how much did this cost your company? You know, I don't know. I can tell you what I've invested in security. Uh, probably about a quarter of a million dollars since this happened. And we're less than a 50-person company, and the value of our company is under $7 million. So, did you, did you have to bear the brunt of the whole uh, bringing in the, yes. the uh, PR company and the whole, the whole We thing? already had that, and that's part of what we tell election officials because we're in the public eye. If you wait until this incident happens to create a relationship with a public relations company, it's too late. Uh, we have had a public relations company that is, uh, you know, we pay and they work for us whenever anything happens uh, for maybe 10 years. So uh, you can't say, oh my goodness, CNN's on the phone, Fox is on the phone, I need public relations help. If you do, it's too late. They need to know your culture and know, uh, you know, how your company responds and acts so that, and this is what I tell election officials, when this happens, doesn't matter whether you got breached or not, but when this happens and the phone starts ringing, it's when you've already got a job to do. I mean, I'm fully employed on a daily basis. My boss is fully employed. All of my product managers are fully employed. When this happened and the phone started ringing, that's another full-time job. So I can choose to not do my job, to keep my customers safe, to keep the products running, all of that, and deal with the media, or, you know, do that and ignore the media and then they're gonna, so it's too late. You have to have that relationship. And what happened was Salter Mitchell came in, we sat down with him, we already had uh, what we call a threat wheel that we had established. It's a message wheel, um, you know, if this, if that, and, and your former military or former DOD, you know why we plan. We don't plan because we expect to execute that plan. Uh, I was former Marine. Uh, they have a saying, the first casualty on the battlefield is the plan. The plan always, you know, you do a coup, a uh, continuity of operations plan, you do that so you have a lay of the battlefield. You understand what may or may not happen. Never have I seen someone plan for a contingency that the contingency rolled out exactly like they planned. But you have familiarity with it when it happens so you can adjust very easily. Instead of waiting until it happens, it's too late to build your plan. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I oh, we're so hiring, by the way. I didn't tell you guys <laughs> that. It's, guys, I'm looking for software developers, IT folks. I, I guess uh, <laughs> a question and a comment. So first, the question, uh, you, you mentioned a lot about the, the PR initially, um, and you mentioned Homeland Security did a, an engagement later. Um, who did the initial digital forensics and incident response? Was that just your team, or did you have a, an my outside dev, my, I have a DevOps team that did the initial, and then when we called in the FBI, mm -hmm. they brought in the Fusion Center. Are you okay. familiar with those guys? Uh, no, but the, the yes. FBI came in. That's the missing. The FBI had a relationship with FDLE. And together with FDLE and the FBI, they have a cybersecurity organization called Fusion Center, and they came in. We gave them a copy of you know, our, our database so they could take a look at everything. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, as an as a information security professional, just a comment. Um, it's fascinating, uh, really great to hear your story. Um, I, I appreciate the presentation, but I think it's kind of, there's pieces of it that are a failure from an operational security standpoint. I, I don't disagree with you. We have opportunities to improve. And well, no, no, I, I don't mean that. I mean, coming in presenting, I, I've never been in a talk where someone's told me they're back up, um, you know, and patching, you know, policies. Like, when you back up, when you patch, like, very specific so right. the technologies in your organization, um, screenshots of the panel that show your admin, you know, account, you know, just stuff like that. It's it's. If you're giving this talk um, across the country in other venues, um, just be a little careful. Just know Scrub it. Got you. Um, I appreciate just, just, feedback. just a pers personal feedback. I, I think it's incredible. Uh, you know, just be a little more careful. <coughs> Got you. 
Yes, sir. You have a question? Okay. Well, I appreciate your time. If anybody's got anything else, I'll hang out. I know you guys have a keynote speaker that you want to get to, and uh, I think he's probably warming up. Yeah, he's got ten minutes. So.